Agora at the Left Hand of God by Robert E. Svoboda. There's a guy who's focused on his task. I'm not sure what this stack of skulls over here is. This is clearly a feral dog that is consuming the body parts. Brotherhood of Life Incorporated, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Setana Publications, Bellingham, Washington. In the series by Robert E. Svoboda, Agora at the Left Hand of God, followed by Agora 2, Kundalini, Kundalini, Agora 3, The Law of Karma. I have the second book. I've, I've read this one before. It is my favorite book. I'm planning to read the second one soon, but first I want to go over this again. Vimalananda's dedication for this book. Dedicated to one who is the source of life. The, 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 the dynamic cosmic energy which pervades the entire universe perennially. The fountainhead of supreme joy, divinity, and magnanimity. My mother Tara. I'm going to stumble over my words at first. I gotta get my shit together. I gotta get my eye on the prize here. Maybe I should have done some uh, vocal exercises to get into it. I don't know. Hell. Vimla Nanda, the subject of this book, designed the cover and dictated to the author the following regarding its symbolic meaning. Gora is darkness, the darkness of ignorance. Agora means light, the absence of darkness. Under the tree of knowledge is an Aguri, a follower of the path of Agora. He has gone beyond ignorance, thanks to the flame of knowledge which billows from the funeral pyre. The funeral pyre is the ultimate reality, a continual reminder that everyone has to die. Knowledge of the ultimate reality of death has taken the Aguri beyond the eight snares of existence. Lust, anger, greed, delusion, envy, shame, disgust, and fear, which bind all beings. The Aguri plays with a human skull. Astonished by the uselessness of limited existence, knowing the whole world to be within him though he is not in the world. His spiritual practices have awakened within him the power of Kundalini, which takes the form of the goddess dancing on the funeral pyre, Smashan Tara. He is bewildered to think that all is within him, not external to him, that he sees it not with the physical eyes, but with the sense of perception. The flame of knowledge is that which preserves life. The eternal flame, the supreme ego, the motherhood of God which creates the whole Maya of the universe and thanks only to whose grace the Aguri has become immortal. The contents of this book have been encapsulated on its cover, the breath, the power, the majesty, and the divine delirium of Agora. Further descriptions found within yada yada. And I'm going to stumble all the fuck over the place. Not only because I'm retarded. Not only because I'm half fucking drunk. Because these words are from another language, brah. But I got this. Opening with the preface. My teacher, the Aguri, Vimalananda, spent many years perfecting his knowledge of Tantra and its advanced discipline, Agora. He distilled his experiences and presented me with the essence. My comprehension of Tantra is due entirely to his instruction and is redolent of the influence of his personality. Tantra is the science of personality. Just as Ayurveda was promulgated by the ancient sages of India as a truly holistic way to maintain the physical body, and just as Ashtanga Yoga is meant to optimize one's spiritual nature, Tantra is a mental science, a metapsychology a method for exploring the mind and developing the range of one's perceptions. It is said that the state of undifferentiated unity is the only absolute reality, and that the cosmos possess only a relative reality because it is not permanent and unchanging. The universe possesses all possible qualities and attributes, and each being within the universe possesses a limited number of qualities and attributes. Personality is the self-identification of the ego with the set of attributes. 
All beings possess egos, and therefore all beings have personalities. The cosmos herself possesses the ultimate personality, the supreme expression of the totality of manifested existence, the Adi Shakti, or Adya. To state that humans, animals, trees, and flowers possess their own individualities and idiosyncrasies is less apt to induce controversy than to assert that even beings which are disembodied or which are embodied but are less individualized than we also possess personality. The issue of disease is a good example. Diseases are beings with parasitical intentions. Some have collective bodies, like worms, bacteria, or viruses, just as bees and ants show signs of collective consciousness. Other diseases, bereft of their own bodies, arise within organ systems of some animal or plant due to metabo metabolic malfunctions. When the intruding personality differs significantly in sophistication of organization from its host, physical disease is likely, for then the attacker's ego will be insufficiently developed to assume control of all essential physiological functions. Conversely, when the spirit of a dead human enters the body of a li living human, it will feel right at home, and the disease will display predominantly mental symptoms such as altered values and habit patterns. Whatever the intruder, cure is the expelling of the alien and the return of the normal personality. An individual's immunity exists on the physical levels in white blood cells and in antibodies, and on the mental level in the degree of personality in integration. The cause of immunity is the ego's power of self-identifying with body and mind. The word ego is used here not in a Freudian sense, but as an indicator for the force of individual, of indi individual identity in the organism. The stronger the self-identification, the greater the immunity to attack from another personality which might usurp some area of the ego's domination. Every cell is ceaselessly remembered by the ego as being part of its organism. When the organism dies, the cells are free, in the absence of the ego's grip, to go their separate ways. If a cell rebels against the ego's domination and seeks to proliferate itself into a new personality, the result is a cancer be the predator external or internal. Disease is its onslaught on one's personality. According to Tantra, everyone is ill who is doomed to live with a limited personality. Only those who go beyond time, space, and causation to become immortal can be said truly in harmony with the cosmos and therefore truly healthy, since health is derived from both internal balance and from harmony with the environment. Hence. One significant area of tantric research has always been methods for prolonging one's life. In one sense, the added years are significant mainly because they indicate the degree of successful achievement of the rituals. Ayurveda is also concerned with longevity, but its approach is to strengthen the, the individual's innate personality. Yoga, recognizing the essential impermanence of the human personality, seeks to efface it entirely to permit one to return directly to the unlimited absolute. Tantra aims to replace the limited personality with an unlimited, permanent one. An individual may fail to become eternal, but may in the course of tantric practice accumulate sufficient energy, shakti, to obtain some extraordinary power, called siddhi. Wisely used siddhis can accelerate one's spiritual evolution. Commercialized, siddhis bind one down more firmly to the wheel of cause and effect. One simple sort of city involves the collection of some particular herb at the astrologically appropriate moment with the appropriate ritual. After further preparation, such plants can bestow superphysical powers on their users. The plant species selected is one known to have an affinity for the sort of power desired. The ritual draws that power into the plant at the moment when it is available in the cosmos to be tapped. The herb's own personality is then overshadowed by the personality of the force drawn into it. Metals and gems are also used in tantric alchemy. Indian alchemists, like their western counterparts, searched for the philosopher's stone, the way to, the way to turn base metal into gold. While exoterically, this base metal 
referred to iron, bronze, brass, and copper. The esoteric reference was to the transmutation of the base metal of the individual's limited consciousness into the gold of enlightenment, a state of unlimited consciousness. An alternative meaning suggests the transmutation of the base metal of the body into the gold of immortality via the touchstone of Amrita, the elixir of life. It is said that herbal-based preparations can prolong one's life for 400 to 500 years, but that through the use of mercury, there is no end to how long one can live. Mercury is regarded as the ultimate metal because it is the sole element which can be brought to life. Repeated herbal applications and treatments with fire bring the mercury to life. It is then treated like a child. Its appetite is awakened and it is fed. At an appropriate point, it is sacrificed. The personality thus created is thereupon liberated to display its attributes. And with the assistance, one can, one can create gold fly in the air or live eternally or rather the new personality can take over one's body and live eternally through it mercury which is less efficiently prepared cannot bestow immortality but can cure disease and increase longevity insoluble preparations of mercury and sulfur are wide, widely used in ayurvedic mes medicine such compounds are byproducts of alchemical experimentation Immortality is a desirable goal in the, concept, in the context of the Indian belief in reincarnation. If one has a long list of karmic connections to be lived through, it is infinitely more convenient to live through them all in one lifetime rather than to be forced to endure rebirth again and again. Herbs and minerals are only two methods for achieving immortality, however. Another method is practiced by agoris, tantrics who have superseded all ritual limita limitations. When they find themselves near death, any good yogi will know of his impending death six months in advance as his prana or life force begins to flow out of his body. Aghoris deliberately leave their bodies and enter the bodies of corpses, taking them over and making them live for as long as they please until they decide to change bodies again. Most dead personalities cannot move about so freely on their own, and some tantrics worship in graveyards and charnel grounds simply to catch hold of human spirits to force them to perform work. This is also a sort of city. The sort of work possible depends upon the power of the captured personality. This method produces quick results, but it is dangerous, for a minor error in ritual may result in insanity, death, or worse. Other ethereal beings who never took human form can also be bound by Tantra, and their tremendous power harnessed. The most puissant are the deities, personifications of various cosmic forces. The ultimate city is control of Adya, the personification of the entire cosmos. Essential, essential to the production of any city are Mantra, Yantra, and Tantra. In the journey towards city, Mantra is the energy which moves your vehicle, the Yantra, according to the roadmap, Tantra. In an industrial anal analogy, the finished product, city, emerges when the raw material, Mantra, is fed into the milling machines, Yantra, According to a fixed process, Tantra. A mantra is a collection of sounds. When pronounced, their vibrations provide energy to the yantra. Sound appears on the electromagnetic spectrum as one variety of energy which can be manipulated by the tantric. There are three main types of mantra. A. Descriptive. Usually in Sanskrit, these mantras describe either the process undergone, the desired goal, or both. B. Meaningless aggregations of sounds which have no known meaning in any human language. C. Bijas. Individual nasalized syllables. Bija, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, means seed. And these seed sounds produce fruit according to the Bija Verksha Nyaya, or the law of seed and tree. The frequent repeti repetition of these bijas eventually results in a sort of standing wave, impermanently energizing either an external yantra or some area of the aspirant's brain, resulting in the continuous production of a specific effect, one which is coherent with the personality invoked. Four types of vani 
or speech exist for the pronunciation of mantra? A. Vikari, vocal speech. B. Madhyama, nasalized speech. C. Pashyanti, purely mental repetition. D. Para, telepathic speech, in which only the intention, but not the sound, is conveyed. The more subtle the speech, the deeper its effect on both the individual and the surrounding environment. Just as a laser produces coherent light, a human brain can produce coherent energy when a, sig when a single frequency, bija, is selected and is amplified appropriately with yantra and tantra. The yantra is the crucible in which the herb, mineral, animal, or human is prepared through the mantra's energy. The yantra contains the energy, reflecting it back upon itself until it can accumulate to the point when, as in a laser, it, of its own accord, projects itself. The projection assumes the form of the deity appertaining to the bija repeated. When mantras other than bijas are employed, the energy will continue to accumulate until it is used or is otherwise discharged. Here, the yantra acts something like a capacitor. Yantras are frequently diagrams drawn on birch bark, crystals, or copper plates, or they can be drawn with powder or sand. Images may be used as yantras, but the best yantra is said to be the human body. Tantras are the three main varieties according to the aspirant's capabilities, external, internal, and mixed. The pashu, or animalistic type of aspirant, is by nature greatly attached to the enjoyment of external sense objects, and so should perform external worship to control these urges to outwardness. The divya, or divine type, tends to be introverted and need not bother with external ritual. These aspirants require entari yaga, internal sacrificial rites. The Vira, or heroic type, can perform both external and internal worship competently, with thorough attention to detail. Everyday life becomes a sacrificial rite for the Vira, with each act an act of worship, hidden at all times from the casual observer. For a Vira, the entire world is a graveyard, filled with the dead. A true tantric regards every human being, including himself, as already dead, since the fact of birth makes death inevitable. For a tantric, and even more so for an aguri, the entire world is his playground and his temple. Still, rituals which make use of literal corpses and skulls are available for those who wish to get quick results. Such practices are part of the Vama Marga, or left hand path, which is the violent counterpart of the Dakshina Marga, or right hand path. The Dakshina Marga is meant for those who seek steady progress with reduced danger of setbacks. The Vama Marga is described as Shigra, Ugra, and Tibra, or, or fast, terrible, and intense. On this path, the chances for catastrophe are great unless a powerful guru's protection is provided. The sexual rituals which have made Tantra notorious are part of Vama Marga. The, the ritual in which sex appears which is known as Panchamankara, is actually of three types depending again upon the class of the celebrant. And in only one type does actual sexual intercourse occur. That version is meant only for the tam Tamasic people, Tamas being mental inertia or dullness. The intensity of the five, Pancha means five, articles of worship, meat, fish, parched grain, wine and sex overwhelm the dullness of the mind with stimulation. If the aspirant has been properly prepared, this increased mental energy can assist his or her spiritual evolution. An ill-prepared aspirant will be overcome by stimulation and will descend into debauchery. Rajasic people, rajas means mental activity, have active minds which must be properly channeled. They need less stimulation and more control to use ginger, radish, boiled as opposed to parched grain, coconut milk, and flowers in their 
Pancha Markara. Sattvic people naturally enjoy ample sattva, balance of mind and alertness, and do not require external aids to worship. They utilize the meat of silence, the fish of breath control, the grain of concentration techniques, and the wine of god intoxication, and the coitus of one's ego with the absolute. The Sanskrit terminology used to describe the Pancha Markara hides this meaning beneath its exterior. For example, fish stands for breath control because one's two nostrils are referred to in yogic terminology as rivers since they are continuously flowing. The right is called the Ganja and the left Yamuna. Just as fish swim in the river, the breath swims through the nostrils. In holding the breath, Kavala Kumbhaka let me try that again. Kavala Kumbhaka is equivalent to eating the fish. The Pancha Markara is only one of many tantric rituals, but it illustrates well the fundamental tantric concept, Bhuta Shuddhi. The physical universe is a permutation of five great elements, earth, water, air, fire, and ether, equivalent respectively to the solid, liquid, and gaseous states of matter heat which transforms matter from one state into another, and the field in which all activity takes place. To achieve universal harmony, these five elements must be harmonized. Pancha Markara is a fast and intense way to do this. Meat stands for earth, fish for water, wine for fire, grain for air, and sex for ether. When one reaches the stage of balance in which these inputs cause no dis disequilibrium of consciousness or metabolism, it is much less likely that any other fluctuation in the five elements will cause disharmony, and a state of health has been reached, since health is a balance and disease is imbalance. This health is infinitely more permanent than ordinary health. To deal with only five elements, though essential in, though essential in every tantric sadhana, would be too mechanistic and tantric authorities advocate personification and accompaniment. Rather than seek to extirpate their emotions entirely as yogic practitioners do, tantrics magnify their emotions and transfer them entirely to a deity, a personified cosmic force. All the aspirants' natural propen propensities can spend themselves in this devotee-deity relationship. Avoiding suppression of any desires which might erupt later to, to disrupt the harmony. Thus, Tantra insists, there is no mukti, freedom from delusion, without bukti, enjoyment. Enjoyment refers to the acceptance of all phenomena which might occur to an individual, be they good, enjoyable, bad, painful. The aspirant relies on the magnanimity of, the, of nature personified as the deity to protect and and provide. Yoga and Vedanta aim directly at Mukti, which was appropriate in earlier ages when the mun mundane world was less demanding. Tantra is more practical for today's world. Ayurveda is meant for those who desire only Mukti or unrestricted sensory enjoyment. It was promulgated as a separate doctrine because many today cannot comprehend health's spiritual aspects. The doctrine of Kundalini and the chakras is associated with that of the five great elements. When the elements have been thoroughly purified in an individual, then the Kundalini Shakti, a goddess in her own right, has a free path upward through the chakras to meet and mate with her Shiva in the brain. Each of the five lower chakras is the seat of the subtle form of one element, and only when they are purified and harmonized can the Kundalini free herself from their grasp. Herbs can be useful to assist in this pr process, as can mercury. Even disembodied spirits can be useful, since they churn the nervous system to the high pitch necessary to withstand the tremendous might of Kundalini, who is the individual equivalent of the cosmic Adya. Each aspirant's perception of Kundalini will differ according to their innate emotional makeup, and therefore many forms of the goddess are available for worship. Whatever the form, 
the aspirant must interact with Kundalini on a personal basis. Some treat her as a sister, some as friend, advisor, or wife. A few regard her as a 16-year-old daughter, and the Agoris treat her as a servant. But my teacher, Vimalananda, opined that it is best to treat her as a mother. In her, asp in, in her aspect as Adya, she is mother of all worlds and all beings. We emerge from her, exist in her, and eventually dissolve into her again. Moreover, a friend may fail you, a wife may quarrel with you, quarrel with you. A servant might rebel against you, but your mother will never desert you. Vimalananda told me, always sit in the lap of the Divine Mother. Let her do everything for you. Rely on her totally, and she will never forsake you. If you try to do things on your own, you will fall and hurt yourself. Only she can take care of you. The greater your bhakti, devotional love for her, the faster you will progress. Bhakti is essential because she is really you. You are a minuscule part of her, and you must love yourself to make progress. Even the masculine deities are all part of her. Whether the tantric aspirant worships a male or female deity depends on the guru, but the outcome will be the same. Kundalini will reunite with her Shiva. First mantra, yantra, and tantra will be used to create the form of the deity in the aspirant's consciousness. Then the, then the devotee and the deity will be together continuously, observing their stipulated relationship, son, mother, husband, wife, or whatever. This is called Tanmayata. Eventually, Tajrupata occurs, in which all but a few vestiges of the devotee's original personality are eliminated, and only the deity's personality remains. For the Panchamakara ritual to be successful, a couple who seek to perform it must first perfect Shiva Lata Mudra, a practice in which all sexual desire is eliminated. The male identifies entirely with Shiva, and the female with Shakti, and this attitude must be held for three hours at a time to ensure success. The Tantras say, Shiva Bhutva Shivam Yajet. First become Shiva, and then you will be able to worship Shiva properly. When this self-identification with the deities is complete, then the, con the, the consumption of fish, meat, grain, wine, and sexual act are no longer acts of indulgence, but become sacraments because the deities themselves partake directly. The merely curious have no business dabbling in Tantra, but some so-called gurus in the West encourage their half-baked followers to do so. Such self-delusive activity reinforces the crystallizations of their personality, which prevent spiritual pro progress. Tantric rituals are sacrificial rites. Though herbs, minerals, and animals are all used as offerings, they are secondary to the true offering, the sacrifice of one's limited self into the sacrificial fire of penance. In the Panchamarkara ritual, the female is the fire into which the male offers semen, just as clarified butter is offered in orthodox fire worship. Ordinary sex is no sacrifice. When two people come together to copulate, they usually seek gratification for themselves, the slaking of their lust. Perhaps indirectly, they will try to satisfy their partners. Tantric sex becomes possible only when one has totally effaced one's own personality and offers oneself for the gratification of the deity, the universe incarnate. This is the one reason why Tantra has always been a closely guarded secret. The danger of abusable knowledge falling into the hands of the unworthy has limited its spread. One should never seek to practice classical Tantra without a guru because no Tantric texts exist which provide thoroughly accurate details of any ritual. Each text omits an essential step or includes far false information, and only through a guru can the reality handed down from teacher to disciple over generations be known. Even if pure Tantra is beyond the reach of most Westerners, the Tantric attitude has much to offer. To consider some of the topics already considered, Western psychology can learn much from the tantric concepts of personality and ego. The concept of individual constitution, not merely in the Ayurvedic sets of Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, but also the mental constitution of Sattva, Divya, Rajas, Vira, and Tamas, Pashu, 
suggests that people can be categorized according to what sort of approach will suit their temperament with, and would therefore be more likely to work. Tantric herbal and mineral preparations are part of Ayurveda and can be evaluated for, the, for their efficacy. The whole physiology of sound and light can be revolutionized by examination of mantra and of visualization. Some of these tantric attitudes are already being employed in the West, perhaps unknowingly. For example, cancer patients are sometimes instructed to visualize to encourage remission. One such visualization might be a school of piranha to, to one such visual visualization might be a school of piranha devouring the dead meat of the tumor mass. This is tantric in nature. The sacrifice of an undesirable personality, the cancer, to an objectified projection of nature, the piranha. Such visualizations are often effective, but because they are inherently combative, they are not as useful for promoting health, which is not aggressive, as they may be for cure. Tantra can suggest new and better visualizations, which could positively increase the individual's stamina, vigor, and happiness, while simultaneously eliminating the disease. Visualizations can also be extended to other autoimmune diseases besides cancer, since autoimmune disease occurs when the ego loses its ability to distinguish what is part of the organism and what is alien to it. Psychologically, this process is already being used in neuro-linguistic neuro programming. Undesirable habits or personality quirks can be altered thereby without analysis, guilt, or trauma, and new traits can be added. Because there is no limit for self-improvement, Tantra can be repeatedly employed to assist in adjustments. For those who are already relatively healthy, Tantra can create deeper levels of harmony and health. Immortality might be generally unobtainable, but a long healthy life is not for which good immunity is required. In Sanskrit, immunity is vyadhi, vyad, I can't say this word, vyadhik sham atva, which means literally forgiveness of the disease. By improper lifestyle and attitudes, we create conditions in our bodies and minds which are agreeable to certain beings, which accept our unspoken invitation and move in. Most of us despise the disease without realizing that we have invited it to ourselves. When one learns to forgive oneself and to forgive the disease and its depredations, then the, disease, then the disease's return is effectively barred. Unfortunately, even the tantric attitude can be dangerous. As one accumulates power, the ego will balloon, will balloon out unless the personality is continuously incinerated simultaneously. Hence. Tantra's insistence that power be objectified and personified, since tantric ritual can be used to create emotions which did not previously exist, perhaps adoption of the tantric attitude can prove therapeutic for those many today who suffer from emotional paralysis, hence Vimalananda's insistence on the greatness of motherly love. From the strictly spiritual point of view, a study of true tantra would provide westerners a proper perspective with which to consider their own spiritual practices. For example, they might begin to regard Kundalini with greater respect after learning of the effects of her complete awakening, or consider the millions who repeat mantras daily. Most are ignorant of the requirements for mantra city, and so will repeat the mantra sincerely for years with very little result, whereas with a little attention to tantric teach teachings, they could make quick progress by learning such things as a the location and the vocal apparatus where the mantra should be recited along with its proper pronunciation. B. The process of Bhuta Shuti and the practice of Nyasa, which prepares the body and mind to act as a fit receptacle for the deity. C. The Dhyana Vidhi, or specific visualization appropriate to the mantra. D. The five great restrictions, which are reciting the mantra daily the same number of times at the same place at the same time with the same offering while observing strict sexual continence during whatever period is set aside for this purpose e the total number of repetitions required which differs for each mantra 
100,000 is often cited, plus the appropriate number and variety of offerings to the five great elements. Though Tantra may sometimes seem hopelessly complex and impractical, one is unavoidably filled with awe at the amazing thoroughness and attention to detail which, which the ancient sages showed while promulgating the science. Even if it cannot be instantly commercialized or otherwise exploited in some mundane fashion, surely Tantra deserves appreciation for its very existence. The greatest benefit of the study of Tantra and Agora is perhaps the enhanced appreciation for motherliness. The doctor who cannot take a motherly attitude towards his patients is a mere pill pusher. My teacher insisted that all males should learn motherly love. Tantra is the worship of mother. It is the most advanced method for inculcating maternal feelings. It is undeniable that as you look to the world, so the world will look to you. If, you, if the world is your mother and all its inhabitants your family, there is never need for loneliness, fear, or despair. As my teacher Vimalananda observed frequently when speaking of the mother, what more does one need to do once the mother has accepted him? She will do everything without being asked. She is the being to be realized. And that, my friends, was the, merely the preface. Jam-packed with material, as you can see. Some beautiful, some insane, some disgusting. This is one hell of a book. I'm going to call it here. And I will return to you soon. God bless.